Hello class, Professor Kinto here. I'm going to take uh, some time to, to elaborate a little on the topic of reapportionment and redistricting. And this is related to both federal government and Texas government. You see the Texas flag here. Uh, but the topic of reapportionment is related to both uh, the, uh, the national government and the state government. So we're going to be looking at some distinctions between the two. We're going to look at the responsibility that the national government has and then passing the baton to the state governments, and in this instance, particularly the state of Texas. So let's move along here. So um, let me talk first off about the census. So the U.S. Constitution since 1789 has had a census uh, requirement. The census is performed in each state, and it's a function that the U.S. government is supposed to carry out every 10 years. We've been doing this uh, since the very beginning. Now, if you look at the language of the U.S. Constitution, you'll see really there are two primary reasons why we do a census. One of those reasons is no longer valid, but the other reason still is. So let's take a closer look at these, and I call these the, the constitutional reasons. We use the census data for a lot of different things. But if you want to look at the origins of the census, it really had two two. Uh, two reasons for doing a census in the U.S. Constitution. So let's look at these. Uh, the first reason, constitutional reason, why we do a census is we have to determine every 10 years how many, how many members in the U.S. House of Representatives each state gets. You may remember um, considering the topic of, uh, of uh, the Virginia plan versus the New Jersey plan and whether or not when the country was put together, there would be equality of, of states regarding power in the national government or whether uh, the power in the national government that a state had would be based upon their, uh, how many people were in that state. But the census is part of a compromise to that. So the Senate, the U.S. Senate, is related to equality of states. But in another chamber, the U.S. House, um, there's no equality. Representation in that chamber is based upon a state's, um, a state's population. And that, gives, that takes us to the primary reason why we do a, a, uh, a census every 10 years. This is how the framers in the beginning um, determined our, what they came up with in determining a, a state's strength in the U.S. House of Representatives. So the census is not related to the U.S. Senate but it's related to the, the U.S. House, okay? because we have to determine uh, that state's population so that we can determine how many members in the U.S. House that state gets until the next census. This is still a valid reason as I make this video, and I'm making this video in 2024. Now, there's another reason why originally, another constitutional reason why we, uh, we did a census or why the census is in the Constitution and uh, this is no longer a valid reason. So in the early 1900s, the United States of America um, uh, went through a, uh, an amending, amendment process. And in the, in the amendment, um, in, in the early part of the 20th century, the American people, the states, ratified the U.S. Constitution to allow the, uh, <clears throat> the national government to impose a personal income tax on you. So that required an amendment to the U.S. Constitution. However, in the beginning of this country, operating under the U.S. Constitution, we didn't have an income tax. So how exactly did the national government get its money? Well, it was based upon the census data. So this is reason number two. They did the census in the beginning to determine not only the, the, uh, the number of people in the U.S. House that state would get, but also to determine how much money a state owed. In other words, the taxes... Uh, that were assessed by the national government were actually assessed on the states. And how much was that tax going to be? It would depend on that state's population. So small states like, uh, like Rhode Island with very little population would not be paying the same amount of tax to the national government that Virginia would be or that New York or Pennsylvania would be, the more populated states. Okay? So this is no longer required by the U.S. Constitution. As I said, whenever, uh, whenever we passed the, uh, the amendment that provided for a, a personal income tax, 
and that's the 16th Amendment in 1913, that second provision, or the second rationale for having a census uh, became extinct. So now the only constitutional reason we do a census is because of what you see in the left-hand column there to determine representation in the U.S. House. Now, as I've already said, we use the census data for a lot of things. We, we, we have made multiple uses for that. And we'll probably learn some of those uses as we work our way through the semester or work our way through this course, but that's not what we're going to do today. Now, <clears throat> let's move along. So let's look at reapportionment. Uh, so once you get that census data in, and remember the census is performed by the, uh, by the, uh, the national government, the federal government, um, we, so we do that census every 10 years. And as I've already said, the reason we do that census, the constitutional reason now, is because we have to determine how that state is going to be represented in the U.S. House. And this is only applicable to the U.S. House. So let me throw some numbers out to you. You've got this number, um, 435. Now, this is a number um, that represents the number of voting members in the U.S. House. So let me elaborate a little bit on this. You've got a, a number of members in the U.S. House, but not all of them get to vote. So, uh, for instance, we've got territories, Puerto Rico, Guam, Virgin Islands. They'll have members in the U.S. House. They'll have uh, members, they'll have uh, delegates in the U.S. House. But because those delegates are not representing states, those delegates don't actually get to cast a vote when it comes to making laws or passing bills. They get to participate in the debate. They can even serve on committees, but they just don't get to pass a vote or pass a, yeah, pass a, pass a vote when it comes to uh, um, deciding whether or not a, a bill will become a law. So that, le that means that right now, since 1911, we have this, this 435 frozen in place. This is voting members only. That number is not in the Constitution. It was set by law by Congress in 1911. So this is the number that's reapportioned or redistributed every 10 years. So what, what are we talking about? We're talking about every 10 years doing a census, and after that census, reapportionment is really about taking this 435, that number that's frozen, and then redistributing them to the states based upon census population. That is what we refer to as reapportionment. This is reapportionment. Okay? So let's move along here. So what I'm going to show you is uh, the, the, the reapportionment results after the 2020 census, the most, the most recent one. So if you look at Texas in the green, California, uh, Illinois, New York, um, <clears throat> you have uh, North Carolina, Florida. So what, are these, what do these colors mean? Well, first off, if you're looking at the gray states, these are states that after reapportionment, reapportionment their number uh, of seats in the U.S. House never changed. If you look at those in yellow, these are the states that, whose numbers decreased. So either they're not growing, California is shrinking actually, either these states are, not, are, are shrinking or they're not growing as fast as some of the other states. So the states in, in yellow here represent states that actually lost their, um, their number in the U.S. House after the most recent census. So if you look at um, Colorado, Montana, Oregon, um, North Carolina, and Florida. These are all states that gained one seat in the U.S. House after the latest reapportionment. Remember, if these states lose seats in yellow, then other states are going to gain. But what about Texas? Texas is dark green. Well, ta-da, Texas was the fastest growing state, and, uh, and the census data after it was re reapportioned, that, uh, that number 435, Texas actually ended up with two extra seats. So California lost a seat, Texas gained two. Texas was the only state after the 2020 census to gain two members in the U.S. House. Okay, let's move along here. So numbers reflect how many seats a state has in the U.S. House until 2031. So remember, they're going to do another census in 2030, and then they'll do this reapportionment uh, probably in 2031, early 2031, maybe late 2030. just depends on how quick they can get the census data back. And as I've already said, in this reapportionment process, some states gain seats, some lose seats, some retain the same number of seats, 
until the next census. So that's why we do the census. That's the constitutional reason why we have to determine how many members a state gets in the U.S. House. Um, those numbers are not frozen because populations change. Some states decrease, some states increase, some states generally remain the same. But regardless, every 10 years, the U.S. Constitution requires us to go back and take another look at, uh, at a population of a state. All right, let's move along here. So now what I want to do is, uh, now that we know that reapportionment is done by the federal government, what's going to happen is that, that uh, the federal government will reapportion. And what they'll do is they'll say, Texas, you have now 38. You used to have 36, and now, now you have 38. And what that means is that <clears throat> the states, including Texas, are going to have to go back to the drawing board and redraw the boundaries of those districts. So prior to the reapportionment, Texas had 36 members in the U.S. House. That means Texas is divided up into 36 congressional districts. But after that census and reapportionment, Texas was told, guess what, Texas? You get two more. So get back to the drawing board, take that census data, and divide Texas into 38 congressional districts, and then uh, you draw the boundaries up. So what we're doing here is we're passing the baton. So apportionment is something that is a burden in the U.S. Constitution on the national government. But the, the Constitution and the interpretation of the Constitution by the U.S. Supreme Court allows the states, this is part of federalism, to conduct a lot of election law. And redistricting these, redrawing these boundaries is related to election law. So now we're passing the baton to the states. The states are told, hey, here's the census data. And here's the reapportionment. Now, you get two more Texas this year for the next 10 years. Now, get to work. Not only uh, so because we added two, two congressional districts to Texas. So, census and reapportionment data sent to Texas in 2021. And by the way, we're still in a pandemic, so everything was slowed down. The pandemic was 2020. And normally, we get the census data fairly quickly. Texas actually couldn't get to the redistricting part because the federal government was, was slow in getting that census data to the states. And uh, so Texas actually had to delay and call a special session in the legislature to get done. But anyway, the census data eventually made it to Texas from the federal government. And then the federal government told us, Texas, you have two, two more seats. And reapportionment resulted in Texas increasing, as I've noted, from 36 to 38 members in the U.S. House. And that means Texas has got to get to work in redrawing those, uh, the districts. So we increased basically from 36 to 38. All right, remember, we're only talking about the U.S. House because the U.S. Senate is about equality to the states, all right? Now, all the states have the same uh, amount of senators. So reapportionment has no uh, relationship whatsoever to the, uh, to the U.S. Senate. That's equality between the states. So then what exactly is redistricting? Uh, redistricting is a drawing or redrawing of district boundaries. Now, well, right now I'm talking to you all about redistricting congressional districts, but there are many other districts that the state legislature is going to redraw. Uh, more information coming on that. So this is what it looked like before. Okay. This is what it looked like uh, before the census and reapportionment. And you'll count here, there's 36. But if you take a look at, at the way uh, in 2024, as I'm making this video looks, you'll see that this is the way Texas is divided up. Now, don't forget, we're talking about U.S. congressional districts. U.S. congressional districts. And this is, uh, this is prior to the reapportionment of 2021, this is after the reapportionment. And if you look on the right hand side, there are 38 congressional districts, and on this side, there are 36. So this map represents the, the addition of two more. And if you were to look more closely, you'd see that the 37th congressional district is here in the Austin area, and the 38th congressional district is in the, the western part, western Houston, the west part of Houston, Harris County. Okay, my old home in uh, and Harris County actually now sits in the 38th Congressional District. By the way, those two districts, the, the 37th currently is controlled by a Democrat, 
in the 38th is controlled by Republicans, so it was kind of a, a wash on both sides. Neither party really gained any control as far as uh, power in the uh, in the state. A lot of folks thought that Texas was going to uh, Texas legislature, since it's controlled by the Republican Party, was really going to uh, do a number on the uh, on the uh, Democrat Party and really make it disproportionate when they start drawing up these boundaries to to benefit the Republican Party in mighty ways. That really didn't happen. Now, if you take a look at, <laughs> at Illinois, the Democrats played, uh, did a number on the Republicans, in my, in my opinion. If you go back, uh, which we're not going to look at in any detail, but, but uh, definitely they drew it up in Illinois. That Democrat-controlled state legislature drew up the congressional districts in Illinois in a, in a big-time favor uh, to their own party. Okay, let's look, move along here. So I know you guys have heard the term gerrymandering, and I'll probably upload uh, a video or two in your course site uh, about the topic of gerrymandering, uh, and I'll, I'll leave that um, specific discussion to those videos, or perhaps I'll assign something for you all to read. But I know you've, you've heard the term gerrymandering before. So gerrymandering is uh, dividing or arranging election districts, uh, that is, while the redistricting process goes on. Redistricting is done by a state legislature. Dividing or arranging election districts in a way that gives one political party an advantage. And it goes all, all the way back. You've probably seen this picture. It looks like some sort of a dragon. This is Eldridge Jerry. This is uh, a map of Massachusetts and its state senate districts under uh, Governor Eldridge Jerry back in the day. That's why it's called gerrymandering. Okay, gerrymandering. So when a state legislature draws up these districts, uh, they're going to draw it up in such a way that greatly benefits their, their own party. I've got to say that both, both Republicans and Democrats know how to play that game. But what, the, uh, what, the, what is the concern is, are we, are we minimizing the voting power of minorities? That's what they're really concerned with. That's really what uh, the problem of gerrymandering in the U.S. Uh, it's not so much that political parties will benefit themselves. It's more along the lines of what we're concerned with in the Constitution is minorities and not political parties. So if these districts are drawn up in such a way that takes away voting power uh, unreasonably from minorities, that will probably generate multiple lawsuits and perhaps even have some successful ones. As I'm making this video, Texas is the subject of a lawsuit um, based on, on that claim. Uh, as I'm making this video, uh, just a, a year or so back, the U.S. Supreme Court took a look at uh, the way um, the, the Alabama state legislature had drawn their districts in a redistricting process, and they found it to be a violation of the, uh, of the Voting Rights Act and, and really the Equal Protection Clause, but the Voting Rights Act the U.S. Voting Rights Act in particular. All right, so anyway, uh, that's gerrymandering, drawing it up in such a way that it benefits your party. That's not necessarily what the U.S., um, that, what the national government is concerned with or should be concerned with, but rather it's when they draw it up in such a way that, uh, that hurts the voting power of minorities. All right, so redistricting in Texas, and we're just about wrapped up here. Let's, uh, let's zero in on Texas. If state legislatures have the responsibility then let's look at this. So the, we know that the Texas legislature has got to redraw those congressional districts, but there are many other political districts inside the state. So let's just shift our attention to what's going on in the state. So the con discussion of congressional districts is about representation in the U.S. House. Okay? But let's zero in on representation in the state of Texas um, in the state legislature. Okay, so the, when the Texas state legislature in 2021 did their redistricting based on census data. They also used that, uh, that census data to draw up 150 state house districts, 31 state senate districts, and 15 board of education districts. So all these districts, these are all related to Texas state government. Um, if you are taking, if you're watching this video and you are part of uh, a Texas government class, uh, you've looked at these districts, uh, the Texas House District and the Texas Senate District. 
uh, I don't necessarily focus on the State Board of Education districts, but the Texas State Board of Education, they are, um, they're elected. Uh, and so the people inside of those districts get to decide who's going to represent that Board of Education District on that board, so they have elections. So um, this Texas legislature, when they redistrict, they have to redistrict those as well. So those are three um, sets of uh, political boundaries, state house districts, state senate districts, state board of education districts, in addition to the congressional districts, which I, which I addressed earlier. And the idea here is every 10 years, we're going to redraw these districts we're going to try to draw the, the, uh, the map up and the boundaries up in such a way that you have roughly the same amount of people in each district. It's about equality of districts. It's about equality of voting power. So these districts are drawn up in such a way to allow uh, equality of uh, people living in these districts, roughly the same amount of people living in each district. Okay, so I think that's all we're going to do. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'm sure I'll reach out to you all with other videos in the future. Take care.